Well, hello everybody. Um, hope everybody's had a really good week. We're going to go ahead and have our Sunday school lesson for this week. Um, last week we uh, celebrated Easter and um, we hope everybody had a great Easter Sunday as we enjoyed uh, celebrating the uh, resurrection of our Savior. And so uh, this week's uh, lesson, we're moving back into the book of Romans again. And we have been working our way through the first six or seven chapters. Uh, this week we're moving into chapter eight. And uh, we have discussed through the first several chapters uh, how Paul really laid out for uh, Christians in the, in the uh, Roman church there uh, why they should feel as though they were justified in their faith as the uh, as the reassurance is given to them that they are Christians because of their faith and uh, through the grace that, that uh, Christ offered and because of his sacrifice on the cross and payment for our sins, um, they could uh, feel assured that they uh, had their faith in Christ and that their salvation was secure and they were justified. Um, this week's lesson, coming off of our Easter lesson last week, uh, actually ties in nicely because the title of our lesson is Secured. And that word secured is what we're going to talk about today. The word security. If you think about the word security, a lot of people relate a lot of different things to the, to that word. Uh, the first thing I think about is these people that have, uh, many people have security systems in their homes. And um, they rely on those for protection from people uh, trying to break into their homes or uh, people trying to steal things from their homes. Uh, that security system is there to give them a little bit of reassurance and peace of mind that their home is protected. Uh, if you go to some, to some places, a bank or some of the places, you'll have a security guard. And that's someone who's there just for extra protection. They got their eyes open. They're looking for people that might be troublemakers, those that might be there to uh, harm other people or to steal or whatever they might, they might be there to do. Their security guard is there as a person that's designated to uh, look out for everyone. And then I thought about uh, a security blanket. Uh, little kids, I know uh, my daughters both had little, little blankets when they were younger, and uh, that little blanket that that child carries around uh, was security to them. It was nothing but a piece of cloth, but for them it was something special. It made them feel safe and protected. And uh, I'm sure everybody's seen the Peanuts cartoons where you had Linus who always carried his uh, blanket around, and uh, that was his security blanket. He wasn't, so he didn't feel safe unless he had it with him all the time. So today we will talk about uh, that word secured. And uh, the title of our lesson is secured. It says, all who accept the gospel have a sure hope for a future as children of God. And those two words that are key words are a sure hope. And that's not the hope like we talked about in the last couple of lessons. That's a verb. This is a, this is a, a word that's a noun, a hope, a sure hope. Um, we sing a song in our many of our churches, and they, almost everybody probably remembers the words, but it's called Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And as we get to the end of the lesson, we'll reflect back to this. But one of the lines in that song is, Safe and secure from all alarms. And so uh, as we uh, study today, I want to look at how we can feel safe and secure in our faith and knowing that Christ is there for us, that our salvation is true and complete and whole and that we can count on it. We went through uh, the, uh, the previous chapters and talking about how we have that assurance of knowing that it's a real present hope that we can have, that we can count on. Um, when we are joined with Jesus through faith, we leave that old way of life, and we talked about back in chapter 5 how Adam represented the old humanity and Christ represents the new humanity. And when we are baptized, it's a picture of our sinful life buried, dead, and away. And as we uh, come out of the water, it's a picture of our new life, our resurrected self uh, in Christ. And so uh, today we we'll talk about how we are no longer condemned because of our sin. And Jesus has dealt with that sin. He's paid for our sin debt. And now we have the promise of salvation because of his great love, because of grace and mercy, and because of our faith in him, we have the promise of that salvation. Um, if you do have your book, we're working in the Explore the Bible series in our church, um, and we'll be working in session eight. Uh, and one of the first thoughts that's uh, given as an example here is if you go to a bank or an institution, you borrow money or you uh, take out a loan, you sign a contract, and that contract uh, puts you under obligation to that lender. And if we uh, fail to keep the terms of that contract, 
if we fail to keep the terms of that contract, there's a penalty that will be assessed. But Jesus died uh, on the cross to pay for that penalty that we had under sin. And he released us from the obligation of the penalty of sin and death. Paul reminds us here is that, that we have no obligation to live according to the flesh. We are free to be guided by the Spirit. Christ released us from that penalty of sin, and we're freed to live by the Spirit. Romans 8 is considered to be one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Um, it begins with the promise that there is no new common, that there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And it ends with the promise of that nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to look back at that verse, verse 39, at the end of our lesson, because it summarizes everything that we're going to be talking about uh, today. The first part of the chapter deals with the role of the law versus the role of the spirit. And as it ends up, we're talking about uh, the assurance of salvation as well. Paul la laid out two possible ways that we can live according to the flesh and according to the spirit. And he says, living according to the flesh sets one's minds on things of the flesh and it results in death. And living by the spirit... Um, a person living according to the uh, Spirit results in life and peace. And a person living according to the flesh is hostile to God. We can't please some, We can't please God if we're living according to the flesh. And only those who are children of God have the Spirit of God, and the Spirit produces life and righteousness in a believer. We're going to be talking uh, as we move through about uh, how we adopted as child, as children of God as well. So let's move on into our lesson. We're going to start out as I read, uh, at the very beginning of chapter 8, and I'm going to read the first uh, 11 verses, and then our lesson picks up with, chapter, with uh, verse 12. Verse 1 in chapter 8 of the book of Romans, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemns sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. And there's where we pick up today's lesson uh, as we've been given there the picture of the Spirit versus the law. So here uh, the first section we'll be talking about is called an eternal future. And we start in verse 12. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So the connection here between this verse and the preceding verses is really strong. We have so then as a result of what he's just said. Earlier, Paul had contrasted a life lived in the flesh and a life lived in the spirit. So in verse 6, he says, Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. And because of the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in the believer, that spirit will bring life to the believer. The spirit of Christ living in believers means that we are not obligated to the flesh. The Greek word here translated obligated, it can refer to someone who is in a debt financially 
or who's someone uh, who is under a moral obligation. And that's what we're talking about here, more of a moral obligation. For Paul, the word flesh here, it refers not to just our physical appetites, but also to the entirety of life in a world that is a rebellion to God. So he says here, we are not obligated to the flesh anymore, to live according to the flesh. We're out of that. He says, because if you live according to flesh, you're going to die. And we've already been, we've already discussed that. And Christ died for our sins. He's taken care of all of that. He says, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, then you'll live. And he says here that our obligation is to the Spirit of God within us. Paul contrasted these two different lifestyles using two if-then type sentences. And that's what we just read. If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if you live by the um, Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body and you'll live. This death will involve God's final judgment on sin and the eternal punishment that will go with it. On the contrary, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This means the deeds of the body are those acts of the flesh that are done according to the flesh. This life is not a physical, but a spiritual and eternal life. Believers are able to put these deeds to death because of the Spirit working within them. Because of the Spirit, we can rely on Him, and we do not live out the deeds of the body. Instead, we put them to death. So the question here in our book says, What does living by the Spirit look like? And how is living by the Spirit connected to living in eternity? So what does answer that first one? What does living by the Spirit look like? Well, it should show in our daily lives. It should, it should show in the things that we say and we do. How we treat others. How we strive to honor God and to represent Him. How we try to follow him. And instead of living uh, the way the world wants us to live, instead of trying to live by the flesh, uh, instead we try to live by following the Spirit and we have our eyes set on God, have our eyes set on following him, trying to please and obey him and honor his word the best we can, and having our eyes focused on our eternal future, not our time here on earth. And our, we have that eternal hope that we can be with Christ. And the uh, second question there is, how is living by the Spirit connected to living in eternity? Well, of course, they tie together because we look forward to that day when we are se celebrate our life with Christ uh, in eternity. As we move to verse 14, the next section here is entitled, An Eternal Inheritance. We have an inheritance that's going to be given to us that's eternal. It's forever. And let's start with verse 14. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba and Father. So verse 14, he mentions, led by God's Spirit, that will be God's sons. Those who are led by God's Spirit, they're able by the Spirit to put to death the evil deeds of the body. Only by the Holy Spirit and leaning on Him and His guidance are we able to put away the things of this world, to make better decisions, to, to turn away from the temptations of sin and evil. And the Holy Spirit guides us through that. Um, but here says, As a shepherd guides his sheep, believers follow, the, uh, follow God's Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is just like a shepherd guiding sheep. Sheep are not uh, very, very smart animals. They need someone to lead them. They look for their shepherd. They like to stay together, and they uh, rely on their shepherd to, to keep them safe. They rely on their shepherd to show them where the water is, to where the grass is, that to, to provide for them. They need someone to lead them, and the Holy Spirit is just like a shepherd for us. He leads us to where we'll be safe. Believers who follow the leadership of God's Spirit are, in fact, children of God. <clears throat> Believers who follow... Uh, excuse me, people who do not have the Spirit of Christ do not belong to God. And as such, they're not children of God, it says here. God's Spirit within the believer creates a family relationship with God and with other believers. Now, the family unit in Paul's day, especially here in Rome, uh, you had slaves and children in the same household. But the role of a slave was seen very much different as the role of one of the children. And believers uh, here were entered into God's families as sons, not as slaves. We have a reference there in verse 15. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption. 
And so we've been adopted into God's family. He says, believers enter God's family by a full adoption. The Greek word translated adoption here, it only occurs five other times in the New Testament. They're in Rome and Galatians and once in Ephesians. And the practice of adoption was very common in Roman society. Uh, we're adopted into God's family and we become fully equal to everybody else. We're not a slave. We're not a second rate. We are become one of his true children when we're adopted into his family. And as such, we have, we have the ability to call, to call out Abba or Father. Also, also could mean Daddy. It's a close relationship. It's not just somebody that's around. He's our dad. He becomes our father. He becomes our, our spiritual father. Uh, we have some uh, families in our church who have some, uh, <clears throat> some history with adoption. They have children that have been adopted. They've adopted. And you, those families in our church... Everybody can see they they're just as loving and as close as any other family, as as true as any biological family could be. They love one another. The children love the parents. The parents love the children, and they love them just like they gave birth to them themselves. They are truly adopted, and they're fully children in that family. And those children adopted those parents at the same time as full parents. They come to each other as a full fledged relationship of parent and child and that's what god does with us he adopts us into himself and he takes us in as his as his children by knowing we are god's children we relate to him differently and we're given a special place in his in his life we're given a special place in god's in god's um in god's worship as we come to him and know that we are fully his children if we came to god and we didn't know that we were fully accepted as his child it would be different. But because we know that he accepts us fully as his child, we're able to come to him in a different way and have a different relationship. It's closer and we can fully rely on him and fully count on him and have confidence in him. Verse 16. <clears throat> the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So let's look at this part. Not only does the Holy Spirit play a role in our becoming children of God, but also the same Holy Spirit plays a role in the awareness of our status as God's children. The Holy Spirit plays a role in making sure we understand we are not just God's children, we're full heirs of God's children, an heir of God. Children uh, inherit what their parents leave behind to them. When they pass away, they leave things to their children. They inherit it, whether it's land or property or whatever it might be. There's an inheritance that's there, and those children fully inherit it. As adopted children, we don't just get a piece. We inherit it fully just like we're one of God's biological children because we are. We're truly God's children, and we, we uh, inherit that full inheritance. We are heirs of God. Well, it also says here that we're co-heirs of Christ. Paul's point is that the Holy Spirit testifies to us and with us as we cry, Abba, Father, assuring us that we belong to him. And added to the blessing of being God's children, Paul pointed out that we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. As heirs of God, we've received that inheritance from God. And Paul described this inheritance as the world, the kingdom, and the hope of eternal life. But to be a co-heir with Christ, to identify with Christ, uh, with Christ in the life he lived, and specifically in his suffering and his glory. Now, this is the part that's a little hard for us to understand, but we do have to accept the fact that as we are co-heirs with Christ, there's two parts to that. We share in his suffering, and we also share in his glory. Paul desired to know he, uh, he, not, he desired to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He says in Philippians chapter 3, he wants to know the power of, God's resur of Christ's resurrection. And he wanted to know the fellowship of his suffering, both pieces that go along together. He wanted to see the suffering and experience it and experience the resurrection and the glory. He knew that they both went together. On his first missionary journey, after having been stoned and left for dead, Paul encouraged new believers to remain strong in their faith. It is necessary, it says in Acts 14, to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. 
you know, we know that Paul and many of the other disciples and many other people that we don't know about in, in Scripture, they faced persecution, they faced, they faced torture, they faced imprisonment, all kinds of things, and they even faced physical harm and some of them death. But the present suffering uh, that we as believers have to endure, <clears throat> it pales in comparison with the glory that's going to be revealed. For Paul at the time, he says, I know that this is bad. I know what I'm going through is tough. I know it's a struggle. I know I'm suffering. But this cannot be one, even one little drop of the glory that I'm going to celebrate as I, as I come, to, come to Christ once I, my salvation is complete. His evaluation of his present situation was not the result of wishful thinking. In verse 18 it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So he says here, I know that I'm in a bad place. He was enslaved, in prison, beat, tortured, all kinds of things. Uh, phys uh, physical torture to his body. But he said, I know that this momentary suffering is going to be nothing compared to the glory that I'm going to receive as I come to Christ. <clears throat> Paul said to the Corinthians, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incom incomparable eternal weight of glory. While suffering never seems light when we are enduring it, the glory awaiting us is beyond our ability to comprehend. So no matter what struggle or suffering we might go through here, as bad as we think it is at the time, you know, it's nothing compared to what, uh, what, to how good things are going to be when we're with God and His glory is truly revealed to us. So when we're going through things like sickness or death in our family or, or job losses or family problems or, or whatever bad struggle it is we're going through in our life, and we sit back and say, this is so bad. I don't think I can get through this. How can it be any worse? We have to remember this is just one little piece of suffering. It's one little drop in time, and we're one person. And that is that one little bad place in our time is absolutely nothing to compare to how great heaven is going to be, how great salvation is going to be, and how great it's going to be to see God's glory revealed fully to us. And to be able to look to that and know it, it's a great promise for us to have. To know that we can have something we can look to, a hope that we can count on, is something we can look forward to. And it helps us to get through those tough times knowing that they're not as bad as we think they are. <clears throat> In verse 19, it says, For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. I'm going to stop there for just a second. The suffering Paul described was not just a human suffering. When Adam sinned, God cursed the ground because of Adam. That's in Genesis 3.17. He cursed the ground. And Paul pictured all of creation waiting with eager anticipation for restoration. Now that word restoration is what I want to talk about in a second. Uh, many of you probably know somebody or maybe you've interested, been interested in your life in these old cars. Uh, a lot of people like to take old cars and they restore them. And the cars have been... They're rusted. They've been sitting out in the weather, maybe in the woods or in a forest or in a barn somewhere, and they faded. The paint's faded. The interior is, is torn and raveled, and uh, the tires are flat. Everything's rusted on it, and the body needs help, and it's, it's just in bad shape. And it's not what it was when it was originally made. But people that can restore cars, they can go through that car piece by piece, part by part, moving, moving piece by moving piece, and replace what's got to be replaced, fix what's got to be fixed, shine it up, paint it, get it all running good, and they restore that car to what it was when it was first made. That shiny automobile that everybody looks at and just, just is amazed by how beautiful it is. And it's even more so when we see something that's in so bad a condition that we say there's no way they're going to bring that car back to where it used to be. And they do. And that's even more of an amazing event when that happens. There's a show called American Restoration. Some of you may have seen it. It's on the History Channel. And this fella that, that he's almost challenged time and time again. And they'll bring him drink machines, pinball games, 
just all kinds of things. And they're destroyed. They're just pieces are missing. None of it works. It looks terrible. And they give him, it's almost a challenge to him. He says, you know, how, what kind of challenge can you bring to me next? I'm, I bet I can do it. And he'll take his team of uh, uh, craftsmen there and, and his welders and painters and, and he'll show you before and then you see the after and they roll it out and you're just thinking, how in the world is he, did he do that? How did he bring it back that far to back to where it used to, used to be? I mean, it looks exactly like it was when it was brand new. And so that's what we look out here. Verse 19, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. <clears throat> On the day when God's sons will be revealed, Believers will see in God's glory the true nature of what it means to be a child of God. The whole creation will be involved as we wait eagerly for the curse to be re reversed. <clears throat> this word futility in verse 20, <clears throat> it describes a state of being that fulfills no purpose and has no use. The cause of this futility lay not in some fault in creation, but in sin which led creation to be subjected unwillingly, unwillingly to this futility. Creation was the victim of the sinful choices of the first couple. God's subjection of creation to fertility refers to the curse God placed on the ground in judgment for Adam's sin. So God created everything in perfection. Sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, animals, everything's made. And God stands back and says, this is good. Everything is good. This is perfect. Creates the Garden of Eden and then creates man and woman, Adam and Eve. And there they are. And he says, you should have dominion over all this. This is, this is perfect. I've made you the perfect place. Here you are. It's yours to enjoy. And everything was just as it should be, the way God had planned. But Adam and Eve sinned, brought sin into the world. And they also brought this word bondage to decay, as Paul puts it. At that place, everything changed. At that point in time, everything was not perfect anymore. Instead, sin and destruction, condemnation, bad, evil, sin, it all came together at one time and it affected the earth. It affected everything. And the, the things were given out, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the instructions were given out from God that the ground was to be cursed, that women would, uh, would experience pain during childbirth, and, and that we would have to work for our food and things like this. And so <clears throat> it says that futility, the futility for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. This is man's sin in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay. So going back to the beginning of that section, 19, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. So let's go all the way back from Adam's and Eve's first sin and all of creation. That group, that group, we're going to call it all of creation, is eagerly waiting for the day in which everything will be restored. We talked about rest rest restoration a minute ago. The creation is eagerly waiting for everything to be fully restored. It says with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. So since that moment in time, there's been this waiting. There's been this anticipation, this long patience, all of history. As creation has waited and waited and waited for this moment when everything will be restored and made new again. It says in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay. See, more than happened than just sin when Adam and Eve sinned. Everything was made tarnished. Everything became sinful. It wasn't perfect anymore. And that's not the way God planned it. But that's what happened because of man's sin. And we've been in that state of bondage to decay ever since. Creation was the victim of the sinful choices of that first couple. 
But this was God. This was not God's final word. Here's the good news about it. If it had been, there wouldn't be any hope. But it was not God's final word. The word hope is sitting there. Hope is possible because God will set free creation itself. All of creation. The phrase translated bondage to decay describes this current state of fallen creation. <clears throat> Subjection to futility is not God's final word. And since the first sin, we've all been in this state of bondage to decay. Verse 21 says, we'll all be set free. Creation will be set free. <clears throat> and Adam and Eve, the first stewards, were responsible for the creation's decay. But, but God promised a new heaven and a new earth. The creation enslaved to decay and corruption will one day be set free. The goal of that freedom will be the glorious freedom of God's children. Because of their sin, the very ones who God had appointed as stewards of his glorious creation were responsible for its slave to uh, it's slavery to decay, but this heaven and new earth in which, dry, in, uh, in, in which righteousness will dwell will come about because of God's promise. <clears throat> in verse 22, <clears throat> it says, For we know that the whole creation has been grown in together with labor pains until now. Well, here we have the whole creation. We have creation again listed. And here, your whole creation would probably refer to anything that was created before man and of which man was responsible for overseeing the animals, the plants, and the things like that. But it says here, the whole creation has been groaning together. They've been agonizing, waiting for perfection again. God's place of perfection and his glory to come about and be restored again. Paul's description of this whole creation groaning together with labor pains brings to mind the curse that Eve received in connection to childbirth. Back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, the suffering was going on right up until the time that Paul was writing. Until now, it says, and it's still going on today. However, just as the result of suffering in childbirth is what? The birth of a new human being. So for all the mothers out there, you know exactly what that's like. That those contractions, labor pains, and the pain of childbirth and what you have to go through, and it doesn't go away. It's there all the way until the birth is complete. And what's there? A beautiful baby as a reward for it. And there's a new thing, a new human, a new being, and a, and a new thing that we can look at and glory about. <clears throat> it says here that uh, just as a result of suffering a childbirth is the just as the result of suffering in childbirth is the birth of a new human being. So the suffering of creation will result in a freedom from bondage to decay, that bondage of the decay that we just talked about. <clears throat> the present fallen world will one day be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. That's in Revelation 21. Creation was perfect. God's glory. Sin ruined that. So we live here knowing that we live in a sinful world. How should we relate to the physical world that we live in every day? As believers, you know, we have to know that we live in this sinful world. And life can be hard. It's not perfect. It's, it's going to be unfair. But because we know uh, as believers that, that we have that promise of a new heaven and a new, and a new earth, we can look forward to God's restoration. We can look forward to, uh, to that just as creation does. We're trying to avoid sin every day. And we look forward to that time when everything is restored and the way God wanted it to be in perfection. And verse 23 says, Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan with ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So first he, re he refers to the uh, whole creation in verse 22, and now he references to us uh, as believers. We have the Spirit. We have, a, we have an advantage. We have the, the Holy Spirit to guide us as the first fruits. That Holy Spirit's there to, uh, to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, like we said about the shepherd with the sheep. As believers, we have that Holy Spirit to remind us of what is to come. It says, eagerly waiting for adoption. So we were told earlier that we were children of God adopted into his family. And now we're eagerly waiting for that adoption to be made complete. 
and the redemption of our bodies to be made to made to be made whole again. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit was described as the down payment for a believer's full inheritance to come in, in Ephesians chapter one. As Paul was writing to the church of Ephesus, he told them that with the Holy Spirit in your life, that's a down payment towards the full payment that's going to come when you take your full inheritance from Christ. They were they were waiting for uh, the adoption to be made complete. Paul made it abundantly clear here that believers are in fact children of God. We live in a fallen world in which we don't yet see what will be when Christ returns again. We don't we, we're not able to see it yet. But we're in fact adopted children of God, and the Holy Spirit is the sign that when our glorious freedom as God's children is fully revealed, we will see him as he really is. The Holy Spirit is guides us and is an indicator and is a, a down payment to us for what is to come. Paul described adoption here as the redemption of our bodies in verse 23. <clears throat> in that day God will um, in that day God will free our bodies from decay and corruption. Paul could speak of redemption as something we already possess. In him we have redemption and as something as we are yet to receive. So we have both. I kind of look at it like this. Uh, this time, adoption focuses on the redemptive act in verse 23. But look at it as a child uh, that's going to be adopted. They already know that they're going to be adopted. They've been told there's a set of parents that's going to adopt you. You're going to have a new home. You're going to have a, you've been promised a new set of parents. But those parents haven't come to pick you up yet. And that's, that's what kind of we're talking about here, is that we've been promised that we've been adopted. We're definitely God's children. He just hasn't come to pick us up yet from the orphanage. And so, uh, same thing in, re in reverse for the parents. There's a set of parents there, and they're eagerly waiting. They say, yes, we want to adopt a child. And yes, we, uh, we are, we're dedicated and committed to that child. And once they find out there's a child that's been promised to them, they're committed. Yes, we've already adopted them before we even go pick them up. Before we even have that baby in our arms, they're ours. We've already committed. We've adopted them. And that's what Paul's saying here. We're waiting for the adoption and waiting for the redemption of our bodies. In verse 24 and 25, it says, Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is, not, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. So here we have the word hope again. And hope by its nature is something that is not yet received. Hope that is seen is not hope. Once we have received what we hope for, we no longer hope. It makes no sense to hope for something that you already have. We cannot want for something to happen that's already happened. We hope for what we cannot see. And this time, hope means we look forward to it with anticipation. We can't wait for it. We look forward to it with eagerness, and uh, and we we hope for it to be here as soon as possible. We you know, it, uh, kids at Christmas time, <clears throat> the closer it gets to Christmas Day, they start to get more and more excited. And then Christmas Day comes, and everybody can remember this growing up. I'm sure when you, when Christmas Day actually comes. It goes so fast, just like every other day. And when the day's over, you're like, man, that just went by so fast. I wish it could have lasted a little longer. And now you, you've you enjoyed it. You look at me and say, the, the anticipation was almost more fun than the day itself. The looking forward to it. The, the excitement of what it's going to be like because we look forward to it. Well, it won't be like that with this. The anticipation is just one thing, but the actual event is going to be something so much greater. We can't even imagine it. Here's a question in our book that says, what are some specific ways the Spirit as first fruits helps us as we wait patiently for Jesus' return? Well, the Spirit helps us. It guides us. It keeps us safe. It shows us the promise. It does all the things that we've talked about uh, through our lesson today uh, by telling, showing us that we have a promise. We have a, a, a down payment for what is about to come. It guides us and helps us understand that we're children of God, that there's a promise there for us as we are waiting for him to return, to, to, uh, to take us as his children completely. 
Although we have been saved, that given the Spirit of, as first fruits and adopted into God's family as beloved children, we still live in a fallen world, and we wait for the full completion of our salvation when we receive our glorified bodies and we dwell in heaven with the Lord forever. That is the unseen thing for which we hope. We eagerly wait for it with patience. Boy, it's tough to eagerly wait for something with patience. If you've ever been through a drive through and you're hungry and you have to be patient, well, you're patient as much as you can be, but you're eagerly patient because you want it. You're being patient, but you want them to hurry up as quick as you can because we're eagerly waiting for our impatience. And that's what we're doing here as Christians now in our world today as we live in this sinful place <clears throat> where sin dominates and sin is still loose that we have to eagerly wait with patience for Christ. But while we do, the Holy Spirit guides us. And as we mentioned at the very beginning of our lesson, that song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, the line says, Safe and secure from all alarms. Secure is what we started our lesson talking about. The security of knowing that we have Christ and we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. He offers us hope. He offers us promise, and he offers us security in knowing that God's glory will be revealed to us and our salvation will be made complete forever as we live as one of God's children. <clears throat> and as we wrap up today, we'll look at two other verses because chapter 8 is such a great uh, uh, chapter in the book of Romans and one section in, in particular uh, near the end of the chapter <clears throat> just sums up everything in Paul is so confident after telling uh, this these uh, things to the Romans about how they can be secure, how they can feel confident. In verse 31, he says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? And that's what we should always think. If God is for us, nobody can stop us. If God's for us, who can defeat us? We have him. Verse 38, I've heard this verse four times this week so i'm definitely going to read it i've seen it on facebook and three other things online and i just feel like god was telling us this is the verse that we need to be focused on at the end of our lesson today i'm going to read it verse 38 and 39 and if you've never read it and you don't have it marked in your bible this one is one to do for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you can read that and not be confident as a Christian that Christ has you as one of his children, he's adopted you, then you need to read some more. Talk to him, pray, ask him to come into your life so you can have that same security and knowledge and knowing that uh, he has adopted you as one of his children. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I pray that you would... Uh, Ask him to be, uh, be your Lord and Savior today. There's no better decision that you can make. As we move through the rest of our book of Romans <clears throat> through the next few weeks, I encourage you to read ahead for our people at Micro First Baptist. Tomorrow, um, I'm doing this Saturday night, by the way. Tomorrow morning, we'll have our <clears throat> drive-in service at 11 o'clock. Encourage you to come and be there if you can. And anything that you can do or, or would, would uh, like for us to pray for, please send us a message and we'll be glad to pray for you. Encourage you to come and let's have a prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for, that, for the opportunity that we have that we can call you Father. As you've told us here in your lesson that uh, we are uh, one of your children, that you've adopted us fully. Lord, just thank you so much for the writings of Paul that he uh, gave to us as he expounds and, and explains on just how much you love us and it shows us just how much confidence we can have in knowing that you've adopted us as, as your children. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity we've had to study your word again. Help us as we study it to apply the things that we learn to our lives. Help us to lean on the Holy Spirit that we can be safe and have security in everything we do as we know that we, uh, as we live through this life and this in a world of sin, that we can look forward to the promise of eternal salvation that you've given to us a hope that uh, that won't that won't doubt the hope that won't uh, that won't fail for us Lord and just help us as we go through each day to lean on that promise help us as we go through each day to strive to be a better example for other people around us and if there's an opportunity we have <clears throat> that we can lead someone towards you to tell them anything good about you father that will help them to come to you to know you as Savior help us to do it and to not deny it 
Lord, be with those who need prayer tonight, Lord Father. Just be with those who need healing, those facing surgeries, sicknesses, illnesses, people that have lost loved ones, and those that are just facing different hardships. Help them to know that this is just one place in their life, but there's eternal hope that they can lean on much stronger. That's you, that if uh, that if you're with them, nothing can defeat them. And Lord, just be with us as we uh, worship tomorrow uh, in our churches. Help all of our churches that are having drive-in services and other types of services. <clears throat> Lord, that we'll have... Uh, productive services that will all uh, strive to worship you and to, to give all the glory to you for everything we accomplish. We pray forgiveness of our sin, and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.